Marcus Tullius Cicero, or Cicero as we know him in English, is one of the most famous men of the Roman Republic. He is well known for his contributions to rhetoric, philosophy, and political science. He is honored with some impressive statues, and there are even six towns named after him in the United States. The life and career of Cicero can be talked about for hours on end. Cicero the polymath and Cicero the politician are both very important sides of his overall illustrious legacy. But today, as you could have guessed from the title, I would like to tell you the story of Cicero the lawyer. The title of this video isn't simply a clickbait to draw more attention by associating the topic with a popular television series. There is no other character that reminds me of Cicero as much as Jimmy McGill. They are both lawyers who are very good at appealing to emotion. They are underdogs in the world they are trying to break into and both of them are conflicted about the integrity of their profession. By the way, the character of Jimmy McGill comes from Cicero, Illinois. Maybe it's just a cute coincidence, but it does add a nice detail to my comparison. Cicero of the story that I'm going to cover in this video is very much the early season's Jimmy McGill. A man who stands up to the powerful establishment in defense of a little guy. It is only later in his life that Cicero would compromise his principles for expediency and become more of a Saul Goodman character. But before this happens, we get to enjoy the story of how Cicero first became famous, how he brought down a corrupt enterprise, and how he coined a legal principle while doing that. This story took place in the year 81 BC. Rome in the late 80s BC wasn't a very hospitable place. It had just gone through a period of brutal civil war between two factions, the Optimates who championed the old order and the interest of the nobility, and the populares who were on the side of the lower classes and radical reforms. The optimates were the victors of this conflict, chiefly thanks to their leader, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, who now ruled as a dictator for life. After gaining a full control of the Republic, Sulla instituted a bloody purge of his political opponents. Those who were deemed a threat to the regime were added to the so-called prescription list. Having your name on this list meant a death sentence. All of the man's property was confiscated, and a reward was offered for his head. The year 82 BC was a very paranoid time for anyone whose loyalty to Sulla could be questioned. Thousands of Roman citizens lost their lives and possessions. But at the start of 81 BC, the purges were winding down. Sulla felt that his reign was now secure, and declared that no new names were to be added to the list after the 1st of June that year. A few months after this date, the story of Cicero's breakout case began. So having your name on the prescription list sounds really bad. But you know what can be almost equally bad? Having your personal data leaked to the hackers. If you use an unencrypted connection on public networks, you run the risk of your data ending up in their own hands. Thankfully, Atlas VPN provides an easy solution to this problem, and you can get it right now at a ridiculously low price. Atlas VPN makes all of your traffic travel through an encrypted tunnel. This way, it protects you from spying and public Wi-Fi dangers, and hides your IP address and your online activities. It allows you to avoid geo restrictions and to get better deals by taking advantage of price adjustments in different regions. Its data breach monitor instantly notifies you whenever one of your email addresses is leaked, so you can react quickly before scammers can take advantage of it. Right now you can get Atlas VPN at a huge discount for just $1.83 a month plus 3 months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Grab this deal before it expires by following the link in the description. Sextus Roskis was a rich landowner and a distinguished citizen of Ameria, a town in southern Umbria. He owned 13 farms, almost all of them adjacent to the Tiber. His son, Sextus Roskis the Younger, managed these farms while the elder aristocrat spent a lot of time in Rome, attending social gatherings and parties. One night in the late 81 BC, Sextus Roscius the Elder was returning from one of these parties through dimly lit streets of Rome. On his way home, he was assailed by a gang of assassins and murdered. His estate was supposed to be inherited by his only living son, but for a reason unknown at the time, the elder Roscius's name ended up on the prescription list. The farms were then confiscated and sold at an auction. A few days later, a distant relative of the two Roski, called Titus Roscius Magnus, showed up at their doorstep with armed men and expelled the younger Sextus from his father's house. This event caused a big uproar in Ameria. 
Roskis the Elder was well known in his town not only for his wealth, but also for his vocal support of Saul's regime. As a rich man with a lot of connections to the aristocracy, he was staunchly on the side of the Optimates in the civil war of the past few years. While others were living in uncertainty and fear of the proscriptions, Roskis was in the forum almost every day, voicing his approval for Saul's policies. That is not to mention that the proscriptions have already officially ended on the 1st of June 81 BC. Having Roskis' name on the list of the proscribed simply made no sense. The town council of Ameria assembled a delegation of 10 citizens, who were sent to Saul's camp to appeal the matter. And while they didn't get a chance to address the dictator personally, they returned back with assurances that everything will be put back in order. However, weeks passed and nothing seemed to be done about the matter of property. The name of the elder Roskis may have been removed from the list, but his son remained exiled from his familial estate. More appeals were sent to Saul's camp, but they were answered with more empty promises. And then there was an attempt on the younger Sextus Roskis's life, and then another one. Fearing for his safety, Roskis fled to Rome. By this time, a rumor had spread that a very powerful man had a special interest in the affair. This man was Lucius Cornelius Chrysogonus, the ex-slave of the dictator and his right-hand man in the matter of proscriptions. His role in the misfortunes of the younger Sextus Roskius wasn't yet clear, but very few people would risk interfering with Chrysogonus's business. Luckily for Sextus Roskius, his father had a lot of friends in the capital who were willing to shelter the destitute son. One of these friends was a respected Roman matron, Caecilia Metella. Metella was a cousin of Saul's wife, so she felt secure enough to present a hindrance to the plans of Chrysogonus. She gave young Sextus a place to stay and offered to provide any help that he might need. And very soon he would have to take her up on this offer. The attempts on his life have ceased, but now Sextus Roskis faced an even greater challenge. He was being accused of patricide, murdering his father. The charge was incredibly serious. Patricide was the gravest crime for a Roman citizen. The punishment for it was an ancient and cruel form of execution. The convicted man was first beaten with rods and then sewn alive into a sack together with four animals. A dog, a cockerel, a viper and an ape. And the sack was then thrown into the river. The religious explanation of this bizarre ritual was very murky even for Cicero's contemporaries. But one thing was clear. The name of the condemned would be eternally cursed, and there was no worse fate than this. The accusers were his distant relatives, Titus Roscius Magnus, whom we already met, and Titus Roscius Capito. Capito was an accomplished retired gladiator. After ending his career, he became gladiator trainer, and Magnus was his disciple. The two of them alone would not present an intimidating legal challenge, but they have recently become the agents of Chrysogonus, and his name was put in fear into the hearts of a lot of Romans. It has now become apparent that Chrysogonus was in the possession of Roscius' estate, and Magnus was simply managing it for him. Coming to the defense of Sextus Roscius in court meant directly crossing the path of Chrysogonus. Very few people in Rome were willing to take this risk. Chrysogonus and his cronies were banking on it. They planned to get rid of Sextus Roscius not by the assassin's blade, but through the sheer influence of Chrysogonus' name. To be honest, I'm quite struck by the audacity of their plot. They evidently wanted to have their cake and eat it too. Even before the court convened, the frivolousness of the charges was apparent. If Sextus Roscius the Elder was on the prescription list, then his murder wasn't unlawful, and the murderer should have actually been rewarded. But if he wasn't on the list, then the auction of his property had to be annulled. The conspirators wanted to keep hold of his estates just long enough to get rid of his heir, at which point the matter would be dropped. It was an absolutely brazen scheme, and its success hinged on the expectation that no one would mount any serious opposition to it in court for fear of retribution from Chrysogonus. And for a long time it looked like that was going to happen. Sextus Roscius and Caecilia Metella enlisted the help of some influential noblemen, but their efforts to find a legal representative were met with very little enthusiasm. One after another, prominent lawyers refused to step up to the challenge. There was no public defense service in the Roman Republic, so if no jurist agreed to take the case, Sextus Roscius would have to represent himself. Fortunately for him, there was at least one man in Rome who was unafraid to defend the accused. 
Marcus Tullius Cicero, or Cicero, was a 26-year-old man who came to Rome from a small town called Arpinum. His provincial background was something that the Roman elites would never let him forget. As a lawyer, Cicero had only a single public case to his name, but he already acquired a good reputation in private law. Exactly how Roscius, Caecile and their agents found him is unknown. Our best guess would be to assume that they exhausted the list of accomplished jurists and had to resort to friends' recommendations. Cicero couldn't have been unaware of the danger into which he was putting himself, but his desire to make a name for himself outweighed the fear of Chrysogonus. Now he would have to translate this bravery to the jury. The jurors had to be so convinced of Roscius' innocence that they would rather provoke the wrath of Chrysogonus than pass the guilty verdict. This was quite a challenge. Cicero dove deep into work, preparing for the case that could either propel his career or destroy his life. He had to get every detail right to compile a convincing picture of the events. He questioned every witness he could find, including the members of the delegation and those who were present at the auction. He also pulled the records of the property transactions to use as the evidence. On the day of the trial, Cicero came prepared. The trial was held in a recently established special court for poisoning and murder. It was presided over by a praetor, Marcus Fanius, who acted as the judge. The decision would be passed by the jury, which in one of these special courts could consist of up to 75 members. To condemn the accused, the majority of the jurors had to vote guilty. The prosecution was headed by Sir Alistair Thorne. So you admit you murdered Corin Harfant? Sorry, wrong movie. The prosecution was headed by a veteran of the forum called Erugius. Magnus was also present on the prosecution's bench. When they saw who would be representing the defense, they were probably relieved. Initially, they weren't expecting anyone to step up, and after learning that there would actually be a defense representative, they may have feared that some highly respected advocate decided to be their opposition. But this 26-year-old provincial with little to no public experience was unlikely to present much of a challenge. We don't know exactly how the trial went, because our only source is Cicero's transcription of his speech. The speech is unlikely to have been delivered all at once, but the placement of the breaks is unclear. So for the purpose of the story, we are going to imagine that both the prosecution and the defense presented their cases in a single go. Cicero doesn't give us Erucius's argument, but we can infer its main points from his responses. Erucius's case was very simple. Sextus Roscius the Younger feared that his father would disinherit him, so he killed him. Why would the father disinherit him? Because he didn't like him. How do we know this? Well, the father was always in Rome, while the son was always back home on the farms. Father never took him to the parties, because the son was a country bumpkin, and the two had nothing in common. That's why he wanted to disinherit him, and that's why the younger Sextus Roscius hired an assassin to kill his father. That's it, no mention of the prescription list, the property auction, or, God forbid, Chrysogonus himself. Everyone who needed to know about Sala's henchman's interest in this case was already well informed. Now, without a detailed knowledge of the case, the story can easily be believed. Add to this the implied influence of Chrysogonus and the unwillingness of the jury to risk offending the regime, and you get yourself a good foundation for the prosecution. Certainly enough to overwhelm the defense of this provincial nobody, who's making an appearance in the forum for the second time only. Erucius was very confident. He was laughing and making jokes on the bench, and seemed sure of the outcome of the trial. That is, until Cicero started speaking. Cicero did not come to mince words. The first few sentences of his speech made Erucius nervous. Right off the bat, Cicero opened up with the condemnation of a man who was not present in the court, but whose person was on everyone's mind. Lucius Cornelius Chrysogonus, said Cicero, has unlawfully seized the extremely valuable and splendid property of another man, but as long as Sextus Roscius is alive, he can't be sure that he can keep it, so he asks you, members of the jury, to remove all uneasiness from his mind and release him from all his fears. After Cicero name-dropped Chrysogonus, a great murmur swept over the crowd. Those who'd been yawning were now fully attentive. People started scurrying around. Some rushed to be the first to inform Chrysogonus about this upstart lawyer 
who is accusing Sal's right-hand man of all sorts of crimes. Others were just hurrying to get out of Dodge before everyone in the attendance was added on a new prescription list. Making note of all of this commotion, Cicero continued his speech. Chrysogonus requests that you relieve him of this anxiety, which worries and torments his mind night and day, and declare yourselves his accomplices in this outrageous theft which he has committed. This was one of the biggest gambles in the history of Roman law. Cicero could have kept Chrysogonus' name out of the trial and blame everything on his subordinates, Capito and Magnus. This would have allowed him to avoid Chrysogonus' wrath in case he lost the trial, but now that bridge was burned. From that point, it was victory or death for Cicero as well as for his client. Next, Cicero went on to recount the events preceding the trial. His tale revealed to the public the details that have been missing. The elder Sextus Roscius had a long-standing feud with two of his distant relatives, Titus Roscius Capito, an accomplished gladiator, and Titus Roscius Magnus, his disciple. On the night when Sextus Roscius was killed, his son was in Ameria, managing the family farms, while Magnus was in Rome. The murder occurred after the nightfall, but the news of it reached Ameria before dawn. The one to bring the news was a freedman called Malius Glaucia, a friend and a dependent of Magnus. This Glaucia traveled 90 kilometers in less than 10 hours to bring news not to the deceased man's son, but directly to his enemy, Capito. Four days after, Capito brought the news of the murder to Chrysogonus in Sulla's camp at Volterra. There, they decided on a plot. Chrysogonus added the murdered man's name on the prescription list and bought his estates at an knockdown price off of a rigged auction. The 13 farms, which were valued at 6 million sesterces, had been sold for measly 2000s. In today's terms, this would be an equivalent of purchasing Mar-a-Lago for 100k. Both sums amount to roughly a double of a soldier's annual pay. Three out of the 13 farms were granted to Capito, while the remaining 10 became the possession of Chrysogonus, who also appointed Magnus to manage his newly gained estate. When citizens of Ameria sent a delegation to Saul's camp, Capito managed to weasel his way into becoming one of the ten delegates. He used his position to redirect the delegation to Chrysogonus instead of Sulla. Capito and Chrysogonus acted like this was all a big misunderstanding and gave an assurance that everything is going to be fixed and the good name of Sextus Roscius is going to be restored. The conspirators first hoped that the Amerians were going to forget about the ordeal, but when they refused to drop the matter, a plot was hatched to murder the younger Sextus Roscius. However, it was unsuccessful, and Roscius fled to Rome to the protection of his father's old friend, Caecilia Metella. Cicero then takes a few minutes to tell everyone what a great woman she is. He even gives Caecilia Metella the greatest praise a Roman woman could earn. He says that she possesses virtue worthy of a man. Now, when he's under the protection of Caecilia Metella, the blade of assassin could no longer reach Sextus Roscius. So Chrysogonus and his cronies decided to get him through the courts. They accused him of the gravest of the crimes, expecting no jurist would be brave enough to defend Roscius for fear of falling afoul of Sulla's regime. They hired a competent prosecutor who could come up with some half-baked arguments to support the accusation, paid a couple of their friends to bear false witness, and thought that it was going to be enough. And it seemed like it was all going to work until Cicero stepped in. Talking about all of this, Cicero took special care to exonerate Sulla of any blame that could rub off onto him from the deeds of his freedmen. He was very brave, but not suicidal, and he probably sincerely believed that all this was done without Sulla's knowledge. Remember also that although Sulla may be fortunate, as he truly is, there is no one so fortunate that he does not, in a large household, possess at least one dishonest slave or freedman. But Cicero still takes a moment to lament the fact that the victory of the aristocracy didn't seem to bring the order that they were hoping for. Did the nobility then fulfill our hopes and recover the country by arms and the sword, simply in order for their freedmen and petty slaves to ransack our goods and property just as it suited them? Then Cicero proceeded to thoroughly dismantle Erucius's argument. Every point of his speech was shown to be frivolous and baseless. Erucius says that the father didn't like the son. Why then would he leave him in charge of all of the property? How would Roscius hire an assassin in Rome if he hasn't been to the capital in years? A special attention is given to Erucius' low characterization of country life. Agriculture was traditionally viewed by the Romans as a noble pursuit. 
Their heroes were men like Cincinnatus, who retired to the farm after a lifetime of public service. So when Erucius was implying that the younger Sexus Roscius was made to cultivate family land as a punishment by his father, he was going against the aristocratic tradition of Roman virtue. To add to all of this, Sextus Roscius has shown no propensity for violence, had a good reputation among his neighbors, and was overall a decent man without a motive, a character, or even an ability to murder his own father. But there was a man, Cicero points out, who had all that, and he was sitting right there on the prosecution's bench. Titus Roscius Magnus was a novice gladiator with a known connection to criminal gangs. He and his friend Capito hated the elder Sextus Roscius, and they have gained the most from his murder. So who is a more likely culprit of the crime? The man to whom it brought wealth? Or the one to whom it brought destitution? The one who was poor before the murder? Or the one who was reduced to poverty after it? A man who made money through violence? Or a man who toiled in the field? Was it the murdered man's enemy? Or his son? This is the qui bono part of Cicero's speech. Qui bono is a Latin phrase that means to whom it benefits. It's an investigative principle of identifying the perpetrators of the crime by looking into those who benefited from it. Cicero attributes its authorship to one Lucius Cassius, but today it is popularly associated with his own name. This argumentation was effective. Continuing to poke holes into the prosecution's case, Cicero returned to verbal attacks on Chrysogonus, noting how he and Capito tried to make fools out of the Amerian delegation. He also brings up how Capito and Magnus refused to produce for questioning the two slaves who were present when Sextus Roscius was killed. The slaves cannot be brought to testify against their master, you say. But that would not be happening. It is Sextus Roscius who is on trial. And if they were interrogated about Roscius, they would not be being examined against their master, since you say that you are their master now. And guess where those slaves were at the moment? That's right, they were on Chrysogonus' stuff. In the finale of his speech, Cicero goes on to destroy basically every aspect of Chrysogonus' image and personality, from his insatiable greed to his stupid curly hair and excessive use of perfume. My favorite example that he brings up is the purchase of a very expensive pressure cooker. His house is crammed with vessels of Corinthian and Delian bronze, including that pressure cooker for which he recently paid so high a price that passers-by who heard the auctioneer calling out the bids assumed that a farm was being sold. That was the final nail in the case. A man who is mocked for his curly hair and his pressure cooker does not command respect and is not feared. Chrysogonus' influence on the jury was waning with every joke made by Cicero at his expense. Sextus Roscius was acquitted of all charges. On the next morning, Cicero received at his door a deluge of potential clients. A new star of the forum was born. Sadly, we don't know what happened to the rest of the characters after the trial. The name of Sextus Roscius was cleared, but whether or not he was reinstated in the possession of his property remains a mystery. There is no record of county charges against Chrysogonus and his cronies. They simply disappear from historical accounts. Cicero gained a lot of confidence and a great reputation after winning the case. He even poked Sulla once again. This time he won a case for a woman to whom Sulla denied citizenship. The dictator didn't seem to mind. After passing his reforms, Sulla was looking towards retirement and didn't care much about the affairs of some lawyer. And the affairs of that particular lawyer were going great. In the months following the Sexus Roscius trial, Cicero was swamped with briefs. He even managed to overwork himself, trying to take on as many cases as possible. His health was quite poor, so soon he decided to take a break and went on a vacation to Greece. Some people thought that he feared Sulla's retribution, but a more likely explanation was that Cicero just wanted to take a break and hopefully improve his oratory skills with the help of Greek tutors. He has shown great promise and his ability to produce well-crafted character assassinations was particularly impressive, but there was still a lot to work on if he hoped to one day be giving speeches in the Senate. Cicero's career was on the beginning. Thank you for watching this video. If you want to read a good fictionalized account of the events that I've described, you can check out Steven Saylor's novel Roman Blood.
There is also a 2005 docudrama called Murder in Rome, made by BBC. You have already seen a lot of footage from it in this video. I enjoyed watching it, but there is a lot of artistic license to make the story more dramatic and to fill in the gaps. Tell me in the comments if you'd like to see another video about Cicero. And feel free to ask any questions that you may have left. Thanks a lot for watching till the end. And I will see you in the next one.